Hey family, good morning. Happy Father's Day to you fathers. It's a great day today to be in this community of believers. Um, I just want to invite you to uh, allow yourselves to be um, take the opportunity, maybe I'll say it this way, um, just to worship the Lord. Don't worry about the feeling or emotion of it. This is, a, 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 it was interesting in, in the Old Testament and in, in the Psalms when they talk about praising God and worshiping Him. It wasn't a, a feeling. It was a, de- a declaration and a decision. And so we're going to do that today. We're just going to decide to praise God and allow the Lord to be uh, lifted up because when that happens, when we begin to say it's not about us, it's only the Lord. Um, that's when everything is set in, the, in its proper place. Um, before we continue, if you bow your heads with me, Father Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we can come um, just to have a, 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 a time of, of worship, a time of praise, and to, to receive your word and the preaching through Pastor Greg. And I pray, God, that God, all throughout all this, this Bay Area and beyond who's listening and, and watching, I pray, God, that right now that they would know that you are in that place. You are there with them. And that, Lord Jesus, it is a holy, a holy room because the praises of your people will be declared. And God, may you be glorified through this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. His love awakens us. It's all about the love of the Lord. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Come on. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Come on, we're going to feel the darkness. It's shaking. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Because you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, 
awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His love awakens us. In all that we've seen in this world. And maybe it is. It's been a struggle for you this week. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you. His love awakens you. But I'm also here to tell you that there is power in the name of Jesus. And sometimes we forget that we're not fighting, we're not battling against flesh and blood. I just want to remind you that by invoking the name of Jesus over your life, by declaring Jesus in your situation, there is power there. There's freedom. There's healing. Let's just sing about that. As we continue to worship, hallelujah. As the morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Cause your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name will let the nation sing louder because nothing has the power to save but your name in your name we pray Jesus in your name we pray come and fill our hearts today Lord give us strength to live for you in glory your name it's a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name oh it's a strong and mighty tower your name it's a shelter like no other Your name 
We'll let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save Cause your name Is a strong and mighty tower Your name Is a shelter like no other Your name Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save But your name Nothing has the power to save But your name There is power in the name of Jesus We sing Jesus over our situations. We sing Jesus over our joy. We sing Jesus over our sorrow. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. sing about a few more names we can use for our Savior. You are here, you're moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're working, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Let's sing this out. Because you are way maker, miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yes, he is, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you're touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, oh. You're healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Just begin to worship Him. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, you're mending every heart. You are here. Oh, you're mending every heart. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. You are way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, oh, you are a way maker, a miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, oh, you are 
Waymaker, a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. That is who you are. You are a waymaker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, church, sing this. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop work, come on, you never stop. You've got to believe it, come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh, you never stop, oh, you. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Oh, even when I don't see that you're working, and even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you are way maker, a miracle work, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. Miracle worker, a promise to you. Light in the darkness, yes, my God, that is who you are. Sing that. That is who you are. 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 Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. That is who you are. That is who you are. And wherever you find yourself right now, I just want to challenge you, encourage you to right now, allow yourself to freely worship your Lord. Maybe it's hands raised. Maybe it's kneeling on the ground. Just begin to worship Him. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Who you are. You're a way maker, Lord. Oh, you're the lion and the lamb. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. That is who you are, Jesus, who you are,
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Sing that verse again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, He's Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the same Christ alone, our 
for all your Christ alone. Oh, we sing your praise. You're a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. You are Jesus. Your name is a mighty tower where we can run and be safe. Hallelujah. God, right now I pray that all across this, this Silicon Valley, Lord, that the name of Jesus would be shouted. God, that we would understand the only way we can be saved is through you. And the only way that this world can change is through you. So, Jesus, we ask you to make a way. We ask you for a miracle. God, I pray that brothers and sisters all across this earth would stand and say that there is an answer to sorrow. There is an answer to disunity. There is an answer to hate. And that answer is Jesus Christ. And the gospel that we proclaim that He is our Savior, He is our Lord. pray, Lord, that we would be, maybe for some of us, just beginning to submit our lives to you. Just being able to say, I can't do this on my own. I've tried and tried and tried. Jesus, I need you to take this burden from me. And if you prayed that prayer, I promise you, there is power in the name of Jesus. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to sing in freedom, to declare that you are good. You are Lord over all, you are cornerstone. Holy Father, I pray you'd be glorified through this time of worship, through this service, and in our lives, and in all we do, I pray in the name of Jesus, everyone said, amen. I appreciate that he like um, plays games with us and he takes us hiking. He hugs me a lot. That like he's really funny all the time. Uh, he loves God. Um, I like that he's very nice and very selfless. He works hard. He helps me with my homework. He plays a video game with me. He plays baseball with me. I like that he um, usually makes waffles for us. That he loves us and he's really funny. That he loves us and he's really cute. Well, he works so hard for us. Um, I appreciate how he's like always there to like help me out with whatever I need. I love Daddy to read my Bible every day. He's always, he's, he can always make me smile, even when I'm not feeling very happy. And 
put it down there. He's really polite to let you help. He, when he tickles me. <laughs> when I try to tickle him, he chases me around the house and then grabs me and chucks me on the couch. He tells funny jokes. Yeah, and cheesy ones too. He just says a whole bunch of dad jokes that are like funny but not funny. Makes very weird jokes that don't ever make sense. Um, occasionally he makes a good joke. Um, my dad uses silly voices when he's talking to my dogs. When he makes funny faces. Funny jokes. I just to blow bubbles at me. And I would <laughs> do the daddy dance. He dances around the house. <laughs> He does this little fun dance. X-ray vision. Um, learning laps. He loves to blow birds out. Lifting mommy. Kindly. Or flight. Probably reading minds because I feel like he does that a lot even in real life. Um, falling asleep. Very fast without falling. Oh! His strong strength. And dad can be the superhero, and we can be the superhero too. That superpower would probably be to feel things again. My dad's superpower would be the manager of all time because he can somehow manage to work worship leaving and his job into all this whole schedule and still be able to spend a lot a good amount of time with us. He looks out for me and he um, looks out if I'm doing bad things or good things. Well, he works hard for us. And he always keeps us like on the right track with life. He works hard for our family we and our dinner. And he always makes us laugh, and he loves us so much. Happy Father's Day! 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 Happy Father's Day, Daddy! Happy Father's Day, Daddy! Happy Father's Day! 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 Happy Father's Day, Daddy! Not that loud. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! and happy Father's Day to all of you there and all of you here. <laughs> happy Father's Day. We want to say a special blessings for the, for the fathers today. So if, you'd, if you're next to your father, grab him. If you're not next to your father, bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we, you are the greatest father. We just come to you and we want to say a special blessing today over the fathers in our lives, um, over the husbands that we have that are fathers, um, over the sons that we have that are fathers. Father, we pray today that you... Give him a special blessing. Father, we pray that you, uh, Father, we already thank you that they are superheroes, Father. They really are, and they have supernatural powers given by you. Uh, Father, we thank you that they have broad shoulders, Father. They can carry the load of a family. Father, we pray that you give them wisdom. Father, we pray that you give them peace uh, as they have to go through this life, Father, through these times even now, and every day there's a new challenge. Father, we thank you that you've given them strength, supernatural strength, Father, um, to carry the family through. Father, we pray that you um, help him, Father, learn from you. You are the greatest example of all of what a father should do. Father, we pray that they get inspired uh, by what you've done, the sacrificial love. Father, we thank you that you bless them with the sacrificial love and increase that love, Father. Uh, we pray, Father, that you give him patience, lots of patience. Uh, Father, we know they all need it, and we thank you that you um, strengthen their bodies, Father, strengthen their mind, Father. And most of all, make them feel today, especially today, Father, but every day, but more today so. Make them feel loved, Father. Make them feel appreciated uh, by the 
the, by the creator of heaven and earth and by their families. Father, we pray that, um, that those, Father, that maybe have lost their fathers, Father, we pray right now, and we know, Father, your, your word says that you don't leave them. You, you are our father, and you adopt us into your family. We pray that they feel that love, Father, and they know that there is a father today that they can celebrate, and that is you. Father, we bless the fathers in our church, Father. Bless, bless the fathers in our lives. Um, bless them today supernaturally. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And this basically depends on uh, what the need is and who is better suited and who has the time to do whatever it is. We learned over years, we went, we went back and forth, uh, we learned that it was best for me to do the bills. And as far as the dishes, we, do, we both do them, but during shelter in place, I learned that Steve is actually faster at it and he uses less water than I do. Um, we just kind of fell into that. It, again, it was just so traditional that I was at home, so I did the home stuff. Uh, I did also manage and still do pain bills and that kind of thing. Uh, so he doesn't have to worry about that because he does a lot of that at work. So I I do that at home, and it, it, that's just how we've done it. And it's worked. It it might not be the real modern um, way of thinking, but it has worked for us. Yeah, we got married. We had one checkbook. Um, all the money got funneled into that. We paid bills from that. It was very easy to manage ourselves. And it wasn't my money and your money, it was our money always. And so that was really never an issue. Even before we got married, we had an account um, for our wedding. And we would put money in that account and, and that's really kind of how we started our marriage. And so um, it wasn't anything that we migrated to, it was just, that, that's just, we started that from, from day one. Well, it's pretty much by giftings. Um, just appreciate the giftings that the Lord gave Bill. And, but there were always those things that nobody feels like doing. And from the beginning, Bill was always a servant. He always did things to help me, to help my life get better and things that maybe I didn't really want to do. And that really spurred me on to be the same way with him, to be a servant to him and to do the things that he didn't want to do. Also, the Bible says to uh, whatever your hand finds to do, to do it. So that's kind of how we operate now. Well, we basically both do whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to understand that one person is always going to do more. It's And it's not 50-50. And uh, just accept that. And some days, some days, uh, KG's going to do a lot more, and some days I'm going to do a lot more, and that's that's the way it is. I would just uh, uh, be accepting of the fact that this is not a 50-50 situation. <laughs> yeah, I, I put down trial and error, you know. You just have to work through the issues, and you work through things. I mean, maybe we've been retired for 10 years now so I'm trying to think of what it was like when we were working but it was, it was probably what she said it was, just, it was just whatever the giftings was we did it and we got it through but when you're home together in the retirement it's, it's a little different so we have worked through it I mean I do the hot and warm wash I do the Costco runs because they have good used to have samples um, so I get to do that stuff and we just do it with, with, it just seems to work itself out but it is trial and error and it's communication and it's caring for each other's needs and it just works out that way so it really it's been kind of fun uh, yes, so um, for me, uh, um, this kind of makes me think about this very archaic expression about um, this is man's work and this is woman's work. Uh, I think from the beginning of our marriage for us, uh, I don't think we've ever really struggled over who does uh, what work in the household, um, especially in a sense of man's work and women's work. It's pretty much just uh, work that has to get done. And that's how I think we've approached it. We both make the bed, but she's better at it. Um, I, I do the yard work and fix stuff around the house because that's what I'm good at. We both do the, the clothes washing and folding of clothes. Uh, as far as cleaning the house, we both help out. Steve does the floors and I do the dust, dusting in the bathrooms. 
Um, shopping, usually I would be, the, I shopped, but then during shelter in place, Steve's been doing all the shopping, so he has a whole new appreciation of this uh, battleground. Yo. Cooking, we both like to cook. Um, Sherry's better at it, unless it's a barbecue or eggs. I do eggs better. It does. Women's roles and man's roles. We've been learning in our series so far that, that there are some practice involved in women's roles and man's roles, but we've been learning more so that really the man or the woman could do anything as long as the man loves his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. And as long as the woman, we're going to learn today, submits to the man and respects him. Happy Father's Day, everybody. And so great to, to be with you today, and I'm glad to celebrate with you through this teaching. And that, uh, man, I don't know what you're getting for Father's Day, but I think if the ladies will listen to God's Word and this teaching today, that you might get the greatest Father's Day gift ever, uh, if, they'll, if they'll learn from what I'm going to teach today. Um, let's go to the Scripture, Ephesians chapter 5. We, we looked at the, the big chunk of Ephesians 5, uh, 21 to 33 last week with the men's part. Now, today we're going to look at the ladies' part of that. Let me read it to you. Ephesians 5, 21 to 24, and then tagging on verse 33. It says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Verse 33, the wife must respect her husbands. Now, I know some ladies just, their spine starts to tingle when we read this verse, that they don't like it, that, that it seems archaic or old-fashioned. And But ladies, you've got to remember that this statement of your submitting and respecting your husbands is in the context of your husband dying for you. It reminds me of the story of the barnyard where... The animals were, were discussing amongst themselves uh, when it came time for the farmer's birthday. And the chicken said to the pig, you know, it's the farmer's birthday. We have to do something really nice for the farmer. He's good to us. Let's treat him nice on his birthday. And the pig said, well, what do you think we ought to do? And the chicken said, well, why don't we make him breakfast? Let's make him, let's make him ham and eggs. And the pig looked at the chicken and said, well, that's a sacrifice for you but it's total commitment for me. And that's really the way this is, that ladies, God is calling you to sacrifice, to sacrifice some will, to sacrifice uh, to come underneath and alongside your husband. But remember, he's called to die for you. And when the couple will understand that and work together that way, there's a beautiful harmony that God intends to be in your marriage relationship. Remember, ladies, that you were called, or the men were called last week, not to step on or step away from the wife in marriage. The woman is called not to step on or in front of the husband, that she's to step in. So man is to step up. Ladies, you're to step in and give him support and love him. The key, first point here in your outline, the key to all of this is found in verse 21, and that's mutual submission. Mutual submission. Remember that we're called to submit to each other all the time. And if we will mutually submit to each other, we'll remove all of the, the stereotypical, you know, women are subservient to all men. And that's why, really why this is important. That in past years and even some today, that there's this mindset in the man's mind and even some in the lady's mind that ladies are to be subservient to all men and all men are to you know, be heads over all women, which is, is just not true. That's not the fact. That sometimes people look at the scriptures and they see the scripture about women's uh, wives submitting to their husbands and the women go, you know, the, the Bible is, is, is not for women. It's, it's, it's for women's domina or men dominating over women, which is not true at all. Back in that day, in the first century, this scripture actually elevated the status of women who were considered slaves or you know, less than even just property that men could dispose of as they pleased. This passage actually elevated women to an equal status with men, that men were to give their lives for them. 
and to, to love them. And this, this statement about mutual submission speaks to the genders in the body of Christ. That remember, guys, that we're brothers and sisters with the ladies, and that the woman you marry was a sister before she was your wife. And ladies, that guy was your brother before he was your husband. And you're called to mutually submit before you get married. And then once you get married, we're called then to uh, wives to submit and respect their husbands. Well, the word submission means to yield oneself to uh, another's will or authority to place yourself under. You can see it in the word submission. Take yourself and you place yourself under the man. That doesn't mean under in the sense of you're less valuable, you're less important, you're less intelligent, you're called just to uh, you know, bow down to him and be his servant all the time. That's not what the word means. The, the, the word submission means equal in value, but different in function. You're to submit to him as your function, not because you're less valuable. Remember, Jesus set all of our value the same on the cross. The value of something is what someone else is willing to pay for it. My son-in-law and I were driving around town. He lives in Manteca. And uh, we're driving around town and saw some homes up for sale. And I told him what the, va- what the, the price of that home would be. And there was a home probably going to go for about two million bucks here in town. Well, in Manteca, that same home would be about 400000 And he said to me, well, I'm not really sure that home is that valuable. I said, well... The value is what someone's willing to pay. Jesus said, our value, men and women, are of equal value because he was willing to pay with his life for each and every one of us. Ladies, we're also called, you're also called to respect your husbands. And we're also called to show uh, respect for each other. That means to show reverence, to show reverence, to treat each other with respect and to have mutual submission one with, an, with, with each other. And this is a willing thing. We're to be willing to submit one to another. So when we get into the marriage relationship, ladies, your submission is to be willing. It's voluntary, not forced, and not uh, coerced in any way. So mutual submission sets the stage. So with that, let's look in, into the ladies' role. Let me give you seven principles of submission and respect. How does the church... Submit to Christ. That's how the ladies are to submit to their husbands. Because this whole passage is, is a comparison. As Christ is the head of the church, so man is the head of the wife. As the church submits to Christ, so the wives should submit to their husbands. And this really got messy. In the same way it got messy for the men, it got messy for the women in Genesis 3, when everything fell apart with sin. That the, the penalty of sin was that men were going to have a struggle in work. The, the, the land would no longer give freely to them, but they were going to have to, by the sweat of their brow, work and toil to produce for their family. For the ladies, the penalty was that there would be great pain in childbirth, and that there's this interesting statement that says, and your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Interesting. In Genesis 4, 7, there's another uh, use of the word desire when it says that sin, talking to Cain now, sin is crouching at your door. I think my mic's breaking up. Thank you. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Same word used for sin crouching at your door. It desires to have you as is woman will desire her husband. That there's a selfish controlling aspect of that. And so ladies, part of the fall is that you'll have a desire to take the leadership from your husband. And the husband's problem is that they're going to have a desire to step away and let you have it, flipping the roles upside down. So when that happens, it's no wonder the marriage is difficult and confusing and not very fulfilling because the man is, is abandoning his position as the leader. The woman wants to take the position as the leader. And it's no wonder why there's so many struggles in marriage when we have those those roles backwards. So number one principle of submission and respect, submission is putting his wants and needs before your own. Ladies, submission is putting his wants and needs before your own. Your husband has to be number one in your life. Now, I'm not talking about number one above all other men. I'm talking about number one, period. Number one over work. Number one over your children. 
Number one over your aspirations. And for the ladies, really, it's, it's the kids that's the issue here. That there's so many that when children are born into the family, that sometimes the kids get elevated to the number one priority and the husband is relegated to a secondary place. And it creates all kinds of problems in the family. Ladies, he has to be your number one. The kids, look, let me, Sandra and I are in this position of life right now, and many that are our age and older are. Let me just, just tell you what's going to happen. Your kids are going to leave you. They're supposed to leave you. And you can see the problem, right? That if you put all of your effort, all of your time, all of your priority into your kids, and then you've pushed your husband into the secondary role, what happens when those kids leave you? Now you're left with the one that's been number two or number three or number four on your list because the kids were uh, elevated to a higher place, and they leave. They're supposed to leave. You raise them to leave. You want them to leave and to have lives and then to have great marriages too. So your husband has to be number one. Make time alone with him. Go ahead and leave for the weekend. Take some time away and leave the kids with grandparents or friends. They'll get over it. And you know what you'll be doing? You'll be teaching them how to model or, or, or giving them a model for when they're adults and they have families, you'll be showing them how to rightly respect and honor their spouse. You know, it's a really sad state of affairs when the children leave home and then the couple has all kinds of struggles because they haven't related to each other very well for the last 18, 20 years, probably more like 30 years if you have you know, more than one child, that you've kind of lost each other in the raising of the children. You have to make him number one, wives. And couples, you have to make sure you prioritize that. Number two, submission and respect are acts of worship to the Lord. When you submit to your husband, wives, you're worshiping God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us kind of a hierarchy of authority, not value, Function and authority. It says that God the Father is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of the woman. And he means that in a marital sense. So there's that hierarchy. So understand, if God has established that hierarchy, ladies, if you can't honor and respect your husband, then how can you honor and respect the one who placed him in that position? When you dishonor him and don't respect him, you're basically dishonoring the one who put him there. And you're dishonoring God. If you want to honor and respect God, honor and respect his choice of headship in your life. Number three, submission that is not passive. Some ladies think this word submission means, oh, just let him you know, rule me and tell me what to do and, and I don't have a say and I just wait for him to tell me how to live and how to act and how to decide. I want to say, have you ever read Proverbs 31? Have you really read that description? of what a godly woman is like? Let me just read, just, to, just give you some of the bullet points of, chap, of chapter 31 of Proverbs. She is of noble character. She brings good to him. She is a hard worker and not lazy. She provides for the family. She looks for ways to prosper her family. She is gracious, compassionate, and generous. Her husband is well-respected. She does not worry about the future, but she prepares for it. She is wise and speaks with trustworthy words. She has integrity. She takes care of the affairs of the home and manages it well. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband praises her. She's not concerned about charm or outward adornment, but the fear of God. She is also praised at the city gates. That doesn't sound like a wallflower lady to me at all. That's a go-getter. That's a functional, powerful, influential woman. So ladies, when it talks about submitting and respecting your husband, it's not saying you just are kind of there passively in the corner waiting for your husband to tell you what to do. You're a teammate and you're productive and you have influence in your life and in the life of your family and in the life of your community. Number four, submission is not subjugating yourself to abuse, however. That some ladies think that well, I got to respect and honor him. I have to submit to him. Well, what if, you know, if he, he, but he's a brute. He's an abuser. Listen, we've, we've got to always look at the whole counsel of God. Scripture says clearly that we must resist the devil and flee from him. Listen, if your husband's treating you like the devil, it's okay to resist and flee from him. Now, I don't mean in a disrespectful, hateful, angry, vengeful, bitter way, but to protect yourself. 
And in extreme cases, it's appropriate to separate. 1 Corinthians 7 speaks of a degree of separation. In that case, it's not for, because there's abuse, but to separate yourself for prayer and for you know, spiritual growth. But you don't have to let yourself be abused, ladies. You can separate yourself. The goal is always redemption and reconciliation, but you don't have to be abused. That's not what submission means, is to allow yourself to be treated poorly. Number five, respect is given whether he deserves it or not. So I can hear some of you ladies saying, respect my husband, he's not respectable. Well, ladies, Scripture says that he has to love you. Is he supposed to love you when you're not lovable? You see, it goes both ways. When Jesus loved the church, that Scripture says in Romans chapter 5 that he loved us when we were yet sinners. He loved us when we were not lovable. In the same way, the husband is called to love you when you're not lovable. Therefore, you're to respect him even if he's not respectable. And that's really, really important. It means that you don't respect him just because he's right. You don't submit to him when he's disagreeable. Now, hopefully he's loving you and, and giving himself for you so that you can freely submit to him and freely respect him. But let's remember, it's not about the condition of him that dictates your behavior. It's the worship before the Lord and honoring and respecting God. Number six, submission and respect open the heart of man to pour into you. This is so huge, ladies. If you want your heart, or if you want your husband's heart to be open to you and attentive to you, and you want him to want you, then you play a big role in creating that inside of him. That, that the word head in the scripture has a, has a derivative to it. Picture a, a river as it runs from its source downstream. And that source, the word is headwaters. And in some uh, deriv derivatives of the word head or headship is headwaters. In other words, he's your source of, of fresh water. He's your source of, of, of vitality and, and, and wonder. He's your headwaters. That is, he can flow into your life. You find pleasure, and you find fulfillment, and you find enjoyment. And that's his goal. He wants to do that. But so many times, ladies, you cut him off, and you kind of build a dam with, with your always having to be right, or questioning him, or disrespecting him, or not submitting to him. And so it actually cuts off the, refresh, the refreshing into your life. You wonder why his heart isn't for you? Now, there may be other circumstances but in many circumstances, it's because you've lacked the respect and submission to him. Therefore, his passion and love can't flow into you. That, in, in a practical sense, how many times have you asked him a question or you've asked for his advice? He freely gives it, and then you disregard it as if it was useless. Or maybe even ridicule his opinions about things. Well, why would he give you his advice again? Next time he asks you, He's not going to give it to you, or he'll pull away and avoid your questioning because what man wants to be ridiculed and, and belittled by his wife? What you've just done is you've cut off the headwaters. You've disallowed him to flow into your life. And, and, and if, if he's thinking, if I give her my advice, she's just going to shoot it down anyway, then he's just not going to give it, and he's going to withdraw from you. And that's exactly what I know you don't want. So many men withdraw from their wives. They don't communicate with their wives. They, they're, they're on the couch with the remote or they're off to, uh, spending more time at work or they're off at other hobbies and they're not with her. Well, there may be some reasons why that you can fix as to why he's doing those things because maybe he's not feeling that you really trust him, that you really honor his advice, that you take his advice when he gives it, that you actually acknowledge that he does have wisdom and that he does have discretion, and he does have integrity. That when you, when you cut him off at the knees, and you belittle him, and you disregard his advice, and, and you question his, his thinking, that why would he want to offer that again? We're not so dumb. We get slapped down once, maybe that's our fault. Get slapped down two or three times, that's enough. So ladies, understand that he's your headwaters. He wants to flow into you, and he wants to, to step in with you. I know that you don't want to take the leadership. I don't really know many women who want to do that. They want their men to step up. But when he's trying to step up, you keep taking it from him by 
taking his advice and discarding it or by not respecting him in any way. You cut him off at the knees. And then when he's demoralized and he is that couch potato, you start losing your attractiveness for him or you start not being attracted to him as you once were when really you've had a role to play in this. Honor him, respect him, build him up. When you build him up, he'll want to step up. When you take his advice, he'll want to share it. When you honor his thinking, he'll want to offer it. This is so important, ladies. You can give him and yourself the greatest gift by honoring him as your head and let him pour into you. And number seven, submission acknowledges the responsibility of headship the Lord has placed on him. Listen, God has put the headship role on the man, not you. You didn't give it to him. God gave it to him. So as he tries to be that, as he tries to lead, help him lead by not making it hard for him. Help him lead by encouraging him. Help him lead by propping him up. It's not an ego-driven thing. It's honoring the head that God has placed there, knowing that that's not your role, and you can't take his role, and he can't delegate it to you. He can't take what God gave him and give it to somebody else. That's his role. And he will dishonor God if he releases that role. So honor him as the one that God has placed in that position. Let me give you some practical things. That's that's a lot of theory, a lot of kind of theology about the relationship from the word. Some practical things you can do, ladies. Remember, let me me give you just uh, um, three, three A's. Remember these three A words. That, that men want. All men want this. Men want attention, affirmation, and affection. Easy to remember, the three A's, okay? Men want attention. Pay attention to him. Pay attention to what he does. Pay attention to what he likes. Okay, mention those things. He wants affirmation. Tell him you're proud of him. Tell him what looks good and, and, and how you honor his work and his work ethic and what he does. Tell him. Give him affirmation and give him affection. There's no man on the planet that doesn't like a woman who wants him and shows him affection and, and comes alongside him in a, in a sweet, loving, affectionate way. All men want that. And ladies, when you give him that, you'll see, as he already mentioned, that his love will pour into your life. So some practical things there that we can do. In, in private or public, treat your husband like an honored guest. In private or public. Sometimes it's easier to do in public. We turn on our good face. We turn on our good behavior but what about in private? Is it a Jekyll and Hyde thing that you're real sweet to him when uh, he's in public and then a nag at home? And it goes the same for the men too, that men will treat their wives politely in public, putting on a show, and at home they treat her like dirt. It goes both ways. But ladies, honor him. Treat him with politeness when you're in private. Treat him like he's a guest and that he is someone to be respected in the home. Number two, don't complain about him to others. Don't complain about him. It's something, this is just for me now, but I, it's something that's the most unattractive thing and putting off thing for me is when I hear women belittling their husbands in a group when the husbands are not around. It's so rude and it's so just unattractive. Ladies, be the one who steps aside and, and is not a part of those conversations. Don't be caught complaining about or talking about your husband's shortcomings in front of uh, other people and other ladies. But be the one who builds him up, who honors him and respects him. Number three, don't lay claim to all the answers because that leaves no room for the husband to step up. If you're always right, how can he step up? He's in a no-win situation. And then that causes him to withdraw. If he can ever be right, why would he even be there? We don't want to fight. We want peace. So if you're always the one that's right and you're always going to bicker or always give an alternative or always have a better way, a better idea, a better strategy, then go ahead. We'll just let you do it because we'd rather just not argue about it, especially in things that, that don't really matter that much. I mean, is there really a right way to load the dishwasher? Really? Is there a right way to separate the recycling and the, and the trash? Is there a right way, you know, to... to Uh, do chores around the house? Or is it just your preference? You see, here's what happens. You might win the preferential battle, but you'll lose your husband. And what is the marriage really about? Is the marriage really about that the patio is organized the way you want it? 
or is the marriage about being close to your husband? You could have the most beautiful home because the husband does everything just the way you want it. But you don't have him because he's off somewhere else. His mind's off somewhere else. He's at work more often than you'd like him to be because at work, maybe he gets honored. Maybe he gets respected for his decisions. People listen to him when he makes a decision. People uh, uh, follow his advice at work. You know what? Maybe husbands would be home at more often if ladies, he felt as respected at home as he does at the office. You see, we can create an environment, women, when your husband wants to be home because he feels honored. And one way to do that is to, is to honor what he thinks. But if you're always right, there's no room for him to step up and to, and to actually help you. Some ladies think like they have to lay down the law. You're not the law. You're not the police. You're the wife. And God has called you to respect and submit to your husband. Number four, be respectful even when disagreeing. There will be disagreements. And ladies, you, you, you have to have a voice. Okay, all this submission respect talk is not about you losing your voice. You have to have a voice. Men want your voice. I, ladies, you're brilliant. You're smart. You're clever. You're talented. No leader in their right mind would dis, dispose of the resource like you. But when there's disagreement, don't be disagreeable. That learn to be respectful when you disagree. And remember that submission only works when you're disagreeing. That submission isn't necessary when you agree. You walk together. But when there's a disagreement, then submission has to take place. And, and you say, okay, I'll defer. And you let him take the lead. So even when you're disagreeing, and there will be, because you have a voice, that be respectful in that disagreement. Number five, plan special things for your husband. Ladies, you got to plan. Remember how you planned when you were courting? I know you planned. You planned the way you were going to dress. You planned your perfume. You planned, you know, every little detail you planned because you wanted to be your best for him. And then after a couple of years of marriage, just stop trying. Now, husbands do this too. Everybody's got to work together on this. But if you, what if you treated him like you treated him when you were courting? How you planned for him. You planned special days. You planned special events. You planned yourself for him. And you made yourself ready for him. I know a man would appreciate it when his wife thinks about him and makes herself nice and keeps herself in a way that, that, that he can enjoy. Plan the attention. You know, sometimes you've got to maybe put the kids to bed early now and then and plan that for your husband. Plan to be available to him when he wants to go away for a while and do it without the kids so that you can be with him and nurture that relationship. It's such a tragedy that I mentioned before that it's hard when the kids leave the home. The second most common time when couples get divorced, the first most common time is about the seven-year time. You've heard of the seven-year itch? Yeah, that's true. Right about then, there starts to be some disillusionment. The second most common time when people get divorced is right at the beginning of the empty nest. When all the kids have left the house, why? This doesn't seem to make it's not too hard to think about, right? You've invested everything into this group, and now the kids have left, which is what they're supposed to do. And now it's just you and him, and you don't know how to relate to each other. You don't even know each other anymore because you haven't really spent any time intimately talking, conversing, planning, sharing goals, dreaming, investing in each other for years because all that's gone into the children. And now you don't know what to do, and you don't even know the person anymore. It's a sad end. Build and work on that now. Make time now and plan now. Number six, prepare yourself for and be affectionate for your husband. Do the same things you did at the beginning. Right at the beginning when you were trying to attract him and how attentive you were. And yeah, okay, so you've heard the same joke a million times. Okay, it's, it's not as funny now as it was when you first heard it. We get it. But we can... Try to present your, to ourselves to each other. Ladies, present yourself to him. Present yourself in a way that's attractive to him and that will make him have his eye stay on you. Well, he, he doesn't want really his eye to wander, but sometimes when there's the stopping and there's the, the releasing of the affection and the effort that it's right about then that maybe some other person is putting in the effort and that's when marriages really start to fall apart. Because temptations are around every corner. 
Now, of course, the men need to keep their eyes on their wives. But like I said, there's temptations everywhere. Present yourself. Plan for it. Keep yourself nice. Do the best you can to, to present yourself to him in a way that's pleasing. Okay? And then number seven, pray for your husband daily. The most powerful thing you can do is not necessarily direct, but indirect. Go to God for your husband. Pray for him. Ask God to bless him. Ask God to anoint him. Ask God to fill him with the Spirit. Ask God to, to uplift him and encourage him and give him creativity and strength and courage in everything that he does. Pray for your husband daily. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Let me just finish with this, giving you some, ladies, some questions to ask yourself, some evaluation questions, okay? Let's go through these. Number one, ladies, ask yourself, do I respect my husband as God's delegated covering over me. Is that how you respect your husband? Number two, do I make God my first priority and therefore respect my husband? If God is your priority, you'll respect your husband because God put him in that role. Number three, do I submit to my husband knowing it opens him up to pour into my life and that honors God? The best thing you could do for you is to honor and respect your husband. Because that will free him up to pour into you. Number four, do I pray for, plan for, and prepare myself for my husband today in the same way I did when we were courting? Ladies, a little effort will go a long way. I know I've learned this from the husband's side. Sometimes you just kind of get in a routine and you stop putting in effort. Let's change that. Both husbands and wives, put in the effort. Go back to the things you did at first, like Ephesians, or like the letter to the Ephesians in Revelation 3. Have you lost your first love? Or Revelation 2. Have you lost your first love? Go back to the things you did at the beginning. Number five, do I realize that treating my husband rudely or critically is dishonoring to God? You want to dishonor God? Be rude to your husband. Treat him critically. Talk about him behind his back. That's rude, but it's more dishonoring to God because God's the one who placed him in that spot. Number six, do I support, affirm, and empower my husband to fulfill God's role? You got to support him, affirm him. God's put him in that position. Number seven, do I view submission and respect for my husband as an act of worship? Maybe he's not always respectable. Maybe he doesn't make all the right decisions. Maybe he doesn't fulfill every dream and every desire. You know what, ladies? Neither do you. None of us is a perfect spouse. So as soon as we drop that search for the perfection in the life and realize that we love and honor and respect our spouses out of worship to God, you'll see differences. You'll see changes in your relationship. When submission is voluntary from the heart and done as an act of worship, ladies, it's for your benefit. It'll please your husband like crazy, but it'll be for your benefit. It's not a beat down. It's not a, you're lesser. You open him up. And he'll be the man, your man, the, the, the only man that you have. He'll be that for you when you submit and respect him. I want to pray for you, ladies. And on this Father's Day, I pray that you'll give your husband that wife. You'll give your husband that, that wonder and that, that, that awe in a marriage relationship. And he'll appreciate it. And he'll open up to you. Let's pray. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you'll touch all of our ladies today. As the men learned last week, and hopefully they've been putting it into practice this week, to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Also, let our ladies submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Lord, I pray for them. I know that not all of their marriages are perfect. None of ours are. But I pray, Lord, that we would work in our marriages and, and strive in every way to honor you by respecting and submitting. Let our ladies prepare themselves and plan for and be kind and polite and respectful and affirming. Lord, I pray that they would be attentive and that they would be affirming and they would be affectionate to their husbands. And Lord, I pray that as their husbands receive that, that they will open up to their wives. God, you designed marriage to work and it works when we work it. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for every couple. I ask you, Lord, that you would create just sweet, sweet intimacy. And therefore, create a model for our children to see and to grow up to be those kind of couples. 
I praise you, Lord, and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day. Let me just leave you just with a couple of announcements before we go. Uh, fill out your connection cards before you tune out, okay? I know you're going to tune out here quickly. Fill out your card. Go to the website. Go to the prayer and care uh, part. Fill out that card. We'll get it, and we can keep our contact uh, right. Also know kids and, and parents with kids, uh, this Wednesday night, 6.30, go to the website and, and get the, the link to the children's program, Children's Focus Super Summer. It's awesome, having great times for the kids on that day. And uh, you'll want to have your kids involved in that. And we're still doing the uh, uh, food drive. Okay, make sure you check that out. And the last thing you got to remember, the next two Sundays, we're going to take a break on the family series, okay? Not next week and the week after, the 28th and the 5th of July, we're going to spend two days taking a brief break, and I'm going to talk about love one another, the biblical response to racism. We are in a crazy time right now with all the racial upheaval, and uh, there's, I know there's lots of questions, lots of uh, thoughts of how do we handle this, what do we do, how do we respond. Well, God's Word has a lot to say about this subject. So um, next week, uh, I'm going to do some teaching on the subject, and then on the 5th of July, we're going to have a panel of different individuals just to help us understand more of what it really feels like in a world uh, where there is struggle between the races. So don't miss those next two Sundays. All right, God bless you. Have a great Father's Day, and, and enjoy it all. And uh, I just hope and pray for a sweet, sweet uh, just love and closeness in your marriages. God bless you.